Welcome back, friends, to another intriguing episode of The Ryan Files. Now, the moon, our closest celestial neighbor, resides just 238,855 miles from Earth, or about 20 times the diameter of Earth. As a boy, I was fascinated by the moon. As an adult, I've come to realize that there's far more to the moon than most of us realize. And the truth of the matter is, we can't live without it. In January of 2017, scientists from UCLA determined that the moon is significantly older than we ever thought, perhaps as older, older than the Earth or the solar system itself, raising questions about its origins. So let's start there. What is the origin of the moon? Every corner of the globe, every culture has a tale about the moon. But here's the kicker. The further back you dig, the fewer stories you find. Some ancient whispers speak of a time before the moon ever graced our skies. Democritus and Anaxagoras taught that there was a time when the earth was without the moon. Aristotle wrote that Arcadia and Greece had a population of Pelasgians and that these Aborigines occupied the land before there was a moon in the sky above the earth. Apollonius of Rhodes mentioned the time when not all the orbs were yet in the heavens. Plutarch wrote about Arcadians following the so-called pre-lunar people. Lucian said that the Arcadians affirmed that they were older than the moon. Censorinus also alludes to the time in the past when there was no moon in the sky. The Tiwanaku culture in Bolivia also refers to a time when there was no moon. They claim the moon arrived between 11,500 and 13,000 years ago, coinciding perfectly with a period called the Younger Dryas event. And as I've said before on this podcast, that is a topic that requires its own episode. I'm on it. In Africa, Zulu legends talk about how the moon is hollow and living inside is an intelligent race of reptilian extraterrestrials. Now the Zulu believe the moon was put into orbit by two brothers who were gods. That's right, once again, we find Enki and Enlil from the Anunnaki. The Zulu also believe that while the arrival of the moon led to a global flood, it eventually changed the tides and stabilized the climate of the earth. Now, of course, most pass off this line of thinking as senseless. And I would somewhat agree, yet these ancient writings exist. And it makes you wonder, why? Is there more to the question than we know? Up until the 1980s, the capture hypothesis was the popular explanation for the moon's existence, stating that the moon was captured by the Earth. Some things in favor of this model include the moon's size, its orbit, and tidal locking. However, understanding the capture mechanism poses challenges, but it's certainly not impossible for Earth to capture a small moon. Researchers have long suspected that wandering asteroids might occasionally get snagged by Earth's gravity and become temporary moons. And a few years ago, one of these was spotted. Called 2006 RH120, it was just an asteroid a few meters across and it wandered into orbit around Earth in July of 2006 before drifting off again a year later. Again in 2020, a dim object called 2020 CD3 was spotted hurtling across the sky. It was determined to be a silicate rock asteroid that became a mini moon of the Earth for about three years. So the capture theory does work, at least for smaller objects. So what about theories from today? The giant impact hypothesis, also known as the Theia collision theory, is one of the leading explanations for the origin of the moon. According to this theory, about 4.5 billion years ago, during the early stages of the formation of our solar system, a Mars-sized protoplanet called Theia collided with the young Earth. Now the impact was incredibly violent and hot, liquefying both the Earth and Theia and ejecting a large amount of debris into space. Now this debris eventually coalesced to form the moon. Now the collision was so powerful that not only did it result in the formation of the moon, but it also contributed to the Earth's early differentiation and the formation of its core, its mantle, and its crust. Just recently, several blobs were discovered near the conjunction of the Earth's mantle and core, and they are believed to be remnants of Theia. Of course, if this theory were true, you would think the composition of the Earth and the Moon would be similar, but we'll get to that. And of course, there's also the biblical account, where we read in Genesis chapter 1, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. 
and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And let us not forget the spiritualist New Age metaphysical version of all this which states the following. The time before the moon was before the nuclear war between the atomic nation of Atala, later called Atlantis, and the Anunnaki, the Zetan Reptilians. Now this all happened about 12,000 years ago. Atala wanted to stop the Anunnaki from using humans as farm animals and slaves. The space empire of the Anunnaki won the war by unleashing their far more powerful antimatter weapons. Consequently, tropical Atala became frozen Antarctica, the Great Flood happened, and widespread earthquakes shook the Earth. And the Zetan reptilians constructed the moon for the purpose of being a monitoring station to prevent another rebellion against their space empire. Now we can argue over the origins of the moon all day long, but you would think that by going to the moon, we would have a better understanding of what it really is, its makeup, its history. But after visiting, all we got were more questions. Now we know the moon isn't the most hospitable place for human beings. In full sun, the temperature on the moon's surface can rise to 260 degrees Fahrenheit, while in darkness, temperatures plummet to around minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit. In the moon's exosphere, it doesn't give any protection against solar radiation. However, there is water on the moon, which was first definitively discovered in 2008 by the Indian mission Chandrayaan-1, which detected water molecules concentrated at the poles, according to NASA. Sure, there are common Earth elements found on the moon, oxygen, iron, silicon, magnesium, and calcium, to just name a few, but there are also some rare Earth metals on the moon, the kinds used in smartphones, computers, and advanced technologies. They include scandium, yttrium, and the 15 lanthanides listed here. I'm not even going to try to pronounce all of those names. In addition, it's estimated that the moon has 10% more titanium than the Earth. But it gets a bit weird from there. Processed metals such as brass and mica have been found on the moon. Copper and zinc are combined on Earth to make brass, but it doesn't occur purely in nature. The moon doesn't have a magnetic field, yet moon rocks are strongly magnetized. And while science says that Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and the oldest rocks we find on our planet are much younger than that, moon rocks are much older, I mean much, much older. Some rocks have been dated to the very beginning of the solar system, and some are said to be even older than that. Helium-3 is a rare isotope of helium on Earth, but NASA says there are estimates of a million tons of it on the moon. This isotope could provide nuclear energy in a fusion reactor, and since it's not radioactive, it wouldn't produce dangerous waste. Speaking of radioactive waste, uranium-236 and neptunium-237 have been found on the moon. Uranium-236 is a radioactive nuclear waste found in spent nuclear fuel rods. Neptunium-237 is a byproduct of nuclear reactors and plutonium production. These radioactive elements don't occur naturally. The only way we see these isotopes on Earth is if we create them. These are just some crazy facts from NASA and MIT scientists that you just never really hear of in the mainstream, which is interesting. But wait, there's more. Our moon is so unique that it's the only moon in our solar system, or even in the observable universe, that has a nearly perfect circular orbit. Now, technically, it's still elliptical. However, there's no other moon that orbits its planet in this way, not even close. And what about the ratio of 108? If you divide the distance from the Earth to the Sun and divide it by the Sun's diameter, you get 108. The same thing happens when you divide the distance from the Earth to the Moon by its diameter. Again, you get 108. Which is interesting because 108 is mentioned again and again in ancient civilizations. Whether it be 108 towers in Cambodia or the significance of 108 in the Hindu religion. And all of these measurements allow for a near perfect solar eclipse. Perfect to within 99.9% .9 coverage. You know, you just saw it recently in April. And the fact that the sun and moon appear the same size in the sky is because the sun's diameter is about 400 times greater than the moon, but the sun is also 400 times further away from the Earth. And how ironic is it that the Earth rotates at a speed 400 times faster than the moon? Interesting. Science tells us the moon is cold and desolate. 
There's no atmosphere, no seismic activity. Its core is cold, unlike the Earth. But the reality is, there's something going on up there. In early 1971, a cloud of water vapor appeared on the moon that covered 100 square miles, lasting for 14 hours before it dissipated. So much for no atmosphere. In fact, over the past century, multiple astronomers have observed this glowing mist in a crater named Plato. Boulder tracks are seen everywhere on the moon, rolling for miles, even going uphill. But with no wind or seismic activity, what's moving them? And from Aristotle to modern day NASA, strange lights have been reported on the surface of the moon, some even visible to the naked eye. There's no explanation for this, so science does what science does best. They give it a name. Transient Lunar Phenomenon, or LPTs, is the name given to these mysterious lights, rocks, and mist. And to this day, there's no explanation for any of them. Since landing on the moon in 1969, you think we would have a better understanding of these mysteries. But instead, it's like we opened Pandora's box with far too many new questions and not enough answers. On Earth, we know that the deeper we dig, the older the rocks are. Makes sense. On the moon, it's just the opposite. The soil on the surface is older than the rocks underneath, and the surface rocks are older than the rocks underneath them. Here on Earth, we see this happen when we dig, drill, or mine as we bring older material to the surface. But this phenomenon happens all over the surface of the moon. It's almost as if the moon had been hollowed out and all the older rock ended up on the surface. Remember how we discussed the modern day theory about the moon and Earth forming together because of the impact of Theia? Well, if they were formed together, why is there such a big discrepancy in their metallic composition? And how ironic is it that some of the strongest materials known to exist in the universe that are highly resistant to corrosion make up the metals of the moon? These are the kind of metals used to build and reinforce large structures. And when you look at the craters on the moon, they all seem to be the same depth, no matter how wide they are. That doesn't make sense. No wonder there are those that believe the moon is a hollow, artificial satellite built out of a hard titanium shell just below the surface. And as crazy as that idea sounds, there's scientific proof to back it up. After their time on the moon and upon returning to the orbiting command module, the Apollo 12 crew intentionally released the lunar lander to crash back into the surface of the moon. Seismic equipment left on the surface showed that the moon literally rang like a bell and reverberated for more than an hour. These results were so alarming that during the Apollo 13 mission, an even heavier object was crashed into the surface of the moon. It rang for over three hours and vibrations traveled to a depth of 20 miles. This would never happen on our dense earth. Such vibrations would dissipate after just a few minutes and would slow down the deeper they traveled. But on the moon, the vibrations traveled faster the deeper they went, again, suggesting a hollow interior. And as surprising as this sounds, it's actually not a complete shocker. We know the moon is about one quarter the size of the earth, but it only has about 1% of the earth's density. It would make sense to find out that the moon is actually hollow. And that's not all folks. The moon is more like a planet than a moon. No other object in this solar system or any other that we've observed has a moon of this size compared to its planet. And its orbit around the earth is far closer than it should be, even though it is slowly moving away from the earth at about one and a half inches per year. And if you wanna get really crazy, well, wrap your head around this. Moon shadows on the earth are actually warmer than areas lit with moonlight, indicating that moonlight is cold which makes no sense when it comes to thermodynamics, but experiments have shown it to be true. Now, this is one of those experiments you can try out for yourself, and I encourage you to exercise your curious mind and test it out. I know I'm gonna try myself. And if you do try this experiment, let us know what the results are in the comments. Now, back to the moon. What about the mysterious structures we see on the moon that appear artificial, all of which have been photographed by scientists, spacecraft, and astronauts? Why are there towers that reach several miles high? Why are there pyramids? Why do these symmetrical structures look like a city? Are these images suggestive of some sort of intelligence on the moon? Were any of these anomalies researched during the Apollo missions? And folks, that's the crux of everything. What is it that they really found on the moon during the infamous Apollo missions? We know that just hours before Apollo 11's Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped foot on the moon, NASA was calling to the craft that they were observing some sort of glowing greenish light on the north side of the moon. Michael Collins radioed back that they were observing the phenomenon too. There's no doubt, it shook them up. Do you remember the press conference the three astronauts gave when they returned? These men don't look like historic American heroes. 
They look sad, afraid, depressed. There's an obvious awkwardness in how they talk about their experience. These men were instant global superheroes. But when they came home, there are stories suggesting they became massive drunks. Neil Armstrong literally angered NASA because of his refusal to do public appearances, eventually going off the grid for more than three decades before resurfacing. It's all so peculiar. What did they see up there? Perhaps with a renewed interest in lunar exploration, we, the public, will finally know the true story of the moon. Until then, we're left with speculation and our own imaginations. Isn't it fascinating to consider the intricate dance between the Earth and the moon? Without the moon's gravitational pull, our planet would be a chaotic mess with unpredictable seasons, tides, and weather patterns. It's remarkable how the moon's mass, orbit, and distance from Earth align so perfectly to sustain life as we know it. Reflecting on this cosmic perfection, it's humbling just to think about how lucky we are that the moon is placed exactly where it needs to be. So the next time you glance up to the moon, take a second to appreciate this silent, mysterious guardian in our night sky and the role it plays in making our world the hospitable planet that it is. Our universe is filled with mysteries and the moon represents one that's very close to our neighborhood in space, friends. And while I am sure that this episode provided more questions than it did answers, never forget that knowing the question is far preferable to never knowing that there was a question in the first place. I appreciate all your support, folks. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you really want to support this endeavor, stop by the ryanfiles.com and smash that become an agent link where you're going to be directed to my Patreon page. For just cents a day, you can become an agent of the Ryan Files and get access to premium content, including my recent behind the scenes documentary episode about my trip to Chile. Now join our community. We would love to have you. Help get the word out, friends. 1,000 subscribers is close on the horizon, and once we get there, the floodgates will start to open. Tell your friends to stop by this YouTube channel and subscribe. In an effort to highlight you, please send a high-res video of how you watch The Ryan Files to the ryanpeltonfiles at gmail.com. Qualified videos will be used for a new intro video to the weekly episodes. I can't wait to see what you send in. Have a great week, my friends, and thanks for tuning in. Be a positive force in this crazy world and find a way this week to be kind to someone just for the heck of it. Stay curious out there, my friends, and I'll see you right here next week on The Ryan Files. The Ryan, the Ryan Files.